Project Ripple, highly suspect that Project Ripple figured out space-time manipulation, figured it, then we figured this out. We've been hiding it. This is why Trump is out there going, we got weapons nobody understands. And as I was saying yesterday, I'm not going to believe in any alien crap until somebody tells the truth about these plasma fusion propulsion drones that we got flying around. Because I almost guarantee these UFOs people are seeing are not aliens. We're just out there testing our plasma orbs, especially the configuration, because we have to get the configuration perfect. Configuration ha can't be just good. It's got to be perfect. And what are they using for that configuration? Quantum computers. How are they making it so they have perfect precision on the orbs when they converge together? You see the, the heat signatures and orbs spinning around. Quantum computers are the things that they're using for that. That's why that, that we've had these quantum computers. And then that's why the public is now building AI quantum computers as well. Let's first start with who are the people that were part of the Ripple project? So John Knuckles from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, a lead nuclear designer who proposed the Ripple concept in April of 1962. He designed and oversaw the key tests, including uh, Pamlico, Ripple 2, and Ripple 3, and to develop the core technological or technical elements like pusherless high gain fusion targets and driver pulse shaping for optimized compression. Now, we spoke about John Knuckles. He just won the Fermi, Enrico Fermi Award, like last year, 2024. He just won that award. He didn't show up in person. I personally suspect that he's in a hyperbolic time chamber, hyperbaric time chamber somewhere. They're keeping his body frozen until they can, you know, have life longevity. It's really weird that all these nuclear scientists are like in their 90s. In their 90s, he just doesn't show up and somebody else just reads his award thing for him. Obviously, I'm joking here, guys, so let's dial it back a little bit. I know I've been catering to the schizos a little much, but there you go. John Foster Jr., director of Lawrence Livermore, uh, or LRL, I think that's uh, Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, who provided leadership, inspiration, and support for Knuckles' work. Oh, Knuckles thanked John Foster, actually. He thanked him. He facilitated the approval process for including ripple tests in Operation Dominic and, adv and advocated for continued development after the tests. Harold Brown. In fact, I'm going to just go ahead and show this here for you guys can see. I'm just reading off the um, <clears throat> this feed here. Take a look at this. Okay. Harold Brown, former leader of the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory Thermonuclear Design Division, who mentored Knuckles. As the DOD's Director of Defense Research and Engineering, he influenced the project by requesting maximum yield devices suitable for missiles like the Titan II. Edward Teller, there he is, fam. If you don't know who Edward Teller is, Teller Ulam device. The thermonuclear Teller Ulam device is named after Edward Teller. He's the father of the thermonuclear weapon. Prominent physicists who urged research into high-yield warheads for high-altitude effectiveness in December of 1961. He predicted major advances by 1965 and pushed for additional ripple tests. Now, this is interesting. This is interesting. As we're going to find here in a minute, right after this in 1962, all the nuclear weapons treaty was signed and no nuclear weapons were allowed to be detonated ever again. And Edward Teller said we would have major advancements by 1965. What, what kind of major advancements was he talking about, right? Uh, and then there's a few more people here. I'm just going to kind of skip through the rest of these in the sake of time. But you guys can check it out yourself if you want. Now, <clears throat> go back to the top of this. Project Ripple. What is Project Ripple? Let me go full screen here for this. We'll come back to that. Project Ripple refers to a classified U.S. nuclear weapons program from the early 1960s developed by the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, now Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Okay, so it is Lawrence Livermore. And uh, LRL got renamed. They always just rename everything. It involved an innovative thermonuclear bomb design tested during Operation Dominic in 1962. The last U.S. atmospheric nuclear test series. So this was the last time we ever detonated nuclear weapons. 
the design was groundbreaking for its ripple concept, which used layered materials and pulse shaping, multiple timed shocks coalescing into a single compressed wave to achieve unprecedented fusion efficiency. What did we just say about four-wave mixing chat? I'm starting to feel everything come together here. Let me read that again. The groundbreaking ripple concept used layered materials and pulse shaping multiple time shocks coalescing into a single compressed wave to achieve unprecedented fusion efficiency. Now, if I were to imagine what's happening in the MH370 videos, uh, you have your three plasma orbs converging perfectly symmetrically on MH370, and then they form into a bubble. They form into a single wave that is tunneling straight through space-time and appearing somewhere else. That's And now when I looked at it, I go, man, this is like you couldn't have the words on the paper any better to describe what I think is going on with the MH370 videos. So the result was a clean fusion bomb, a clean fusion bomb with a high fusion to fission ratio. So what we've done here is we've minimized the, the fission bomb portion, the A bomb portion, and we maximize the H bomb portion, the fusion bomb portion. So now we're already saying, okay, let's get rid of the H bomb. Now we just want the fusion bomb side of it. And then what's the next step, chat? What do you guys think the next step is? Oh. A neutronic. We don't want that. We don't want the neutrons at all. We want pure energy conversion. Pure energy. I keep thinking in the back of my head, Hal Pudoff. Hal Pudoff's email response. I'm not familiar with that technology. It doesn't look like anything to me. I don't know. I have no idea how a neutronic fusion could be connected to the polarizable vacuum model. Beep boop, beep boop. Dude, it's like Yoda not talking about not knowing what the force is. Okay. And it says, this resulted in a high fusion to fission ratio, minimizing radioactive fallout and a yield to weight ratio, potentially 10 times better than modern warheads. So not only does it increase the efficiency, but it also becomes 10 times lighter, probably much more than that. So now your thermonuclear weapon becomes super lightweight. Because all you need is your, your fusion payload can be relatively small. Somebody was asking me, how much pounds of lithium do they need on MH370? And my answer is not a lot. Probably a very small amount. In fact, lithium begins to form a chain reaction that keeps going. So I don't even know how much, but it's not probably 500 pounds worth. Probably a lot less than that. It pushed towards higher purity fusion reactions in a weaponized context, making it what some describe as the most advanced full-scale fusion device ever tested. However, its bulky volume limited practical deployment and further development was halted by the Partial Test Ban Treaty, also known as the Limited Test Ban Treaty in 1963, which prohibited atmospheric nuclear tests to curb environmental fallout and arms escalation. So the test ban treaty, this refers to two agreements, 1963 and uh, 1996. So 1963 was the partial test ban treaty, which banned nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, outer space and underwater. And in 1996, the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty prohibited all nuclear explosions, including underground ones, for any purpose whatsoever. The partial, ban, uh, partial treaty was motivated by the Cold War, also public health concerns over the fallout and arms control. They didn't want things to get too out of control with these weapons. Um, so basically, this, uh, this uh, established a de facto global memorandum on explosive testing since the 1960s. So in the context of MH370, we basically committed a war crime. <laughs> like we committed a war crime with MH370. We used a thermonuclear weapon that we're not even allowed to use. 
So this actually now leads me further down the belief that we were showing China what's good with MH370. We were telling China, yep, we own you. We have literally thermonuclear weapons and we will use them and break the treaties because there ain't nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, so I had it, I asked the AI to connect the idea of a neutronic fusion. So this is the part where we're broaching now the speculative aspect of this. Like how does a neutronic fusion, the ripple project and space time manipulation come together? The interconnected significance of these elements lies in the dual nature of fusion technology blurring the lines between peaceful energy research and nuclear weapons advancement. Project Ripple exemplified early efforts to maximize fusion yield in bombs that directly inform modern civilian fusion power research, such as laser-driven inertial confinement fusion at the NIF, the National Ignition Facility. A neutronic fusion amplifies this by promising a cleaner energy but also enabling hypothetical pure fusion weapons. Devices achieving explosive yields without a fission trigger, thus avoiding fiss fissile material controls, producing less fallout and potentially delivering targeted neutron radiation effects. So the test ban treaties were pivotal in stopping these projects and limiting weapons ev evolution through explosive testing. So think about this. This is so crazy. I think I'm right, chat. I think I'm right. Like we, the A neutronic fusion, we created a pure fusion bomb and the A neutronic component made it even more efficient. And the moment we figured it out, we banned everybody else from researching it. We banned everybody from researching it. No tests, no research no escalation how weird is the timing of the partial best test ban treaty treaty one year after project ripple one year after project ripple they're like okay nobody's allowed to do this anywhere in the world like we figured out how to manipulate space time we figured out efficiencies of pure fusion bombs way higher than anything else so then i asked it to explain how we can connect to hal pudas polarizable vacuum model so the AI is going to be wrong here. And I expected the AI to be wrong here. Why? Because if the AI was able to get this right, then it would be public knowledge. Again, the AI is just a database. And the world doesn't know this information. So the AI can never get this information correct. Because the sources it's using, there's all sanitized sources that don't understand these concepts. So here's what the AI said, because you can still learn from this, even when the AI is wrong. So why does the AI think that you can't do this to manipulate space-time? Let's see what it says. It says, the polarizable vacuum model allows for space-time manipulation in principle through vacuum engineering. A clean fusion bomb could not achieve this due to insufficient energy densities, lack of control, and incompatibility with the required negative or precisely modulated energy forms. Well, that's all wrong. That's all wrong. Like that's not, that's a terrible argument. We can't achieve the energy densities. Bullshit. We can't achieve the energy densities. You just, the AI just told me that the fusion bombs were achieving energy densities that are completely unprecedented. <laughs> so what, how does that, how do you jive those two thoughts in your head? Do the aneutronic fusion bombs produce super high energy densities or do they not? And again, energy density is just a matter of you take this energy and you compact it to a small area, right? As opposed to having it expand out everywhere. And it also says, oh, we don't have precise enough control. We don't have precise enough control. That's the whole point. Isn't the whole thing about pulse shaping? This is where the perfect equilateral triangles come into, into play. Why are we seeing these perfect equilateral triangles? Because they're able to have precise control over the waves. If you have a perfect equilateral triangle, you have perfect compression, concise, perfect control over your waves. So I basically pushed back and I said, 
your response contradicts itself. Like you're literally saying that we have these energy requirements and you can achieve them. And so then what it says after that, because I have it connect to the idea of wormholes. And it says, there's no way that you can do this, even with wormholes. The power advantage over an A-bomb is real, but it's irrelevant. Why? Because the gaps in energy density and the lack of negative energy are too vast. Once again, the AI is wrong. <laughs> Once again, the AI is wrong again. Why? Because what did Matt Visser find out? What did Matt Visser and Eric W. Davis teach us? They taught us that we only need an arbitrarily small, quote unquote, an arbitrarily small amount of negative energy. We don't need a huge amount of negative energy. Why? Because we can create a polyhedral configuration and a spinning wormhole. And these things, the centripetal motion of the spinning wormhole and the polyhedral configuration minimize the ener negative energy requirement. So now that impossibly high amount of energy that we need has now been significantly lowered. So I had the AI I said, I said, hey, AI, I, you know, I appreciate your response, but I told the AI, you, the negative energy requirement can be reduced to an arbitrarily small amount, according to Matt Visser and Eric W. Davis using this polyhedral. So then they review it and they go, what the AI's final response is, uh, while Visser and Davis show that negative energy can be dialed down arbitrarily in optimized polyhedral spinning setups, a clean fusion bomb lacks the negative structured and topological elements needed. I would argue the exact opposite. <laughs> I would argue the exact opposite. According to Salvatore Pais, the way we achieve the negative energy requirement is we hit the Schwinger limit. The Schwinger limit is the ceiling on how much energy density space-time can contain before it collapses. And when space-time collapses, that's your negative energy. It goes from our what we call our false vacuum, which is what we think of as outer space, to the true vacuum where you remove the zero point energy, the true vacuum. And there's your negative energy right there. So that's what our negative energy. So to me, the AI simply is not understanding the concept of negative energy because it's using the mystical Harry Potter swirly purple substance idea of negative energy. And it says, it's like trying to build a bridge with dynamite alone. Explosive power doesn't equate to engineering the right form. I agree entirely, Grok. That's why we're not using explosive power. In fact, we're doing the opposite of explosive power. We're creating an impl implosive effect, not an explosive effect. So the reason why Grok doesn't understand is Grok is thinking, oh, your energy is going to disperse everywhere. No, we're using inertial confinement fusion. Inertial confinement fusion causes an implosion. And what happens in an implosion chat? The energy density goes up when you implode something. Booyah.